Wow, you, oh yeah, wow. <laughs> Sorry, David, I didn't mean such a big wow there. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, wow, you sound like you really believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> I am, uh, I was going to say excited. Uh, I'm not sure if that's quite the right word, but I am really anticipating sharing the message with you this morning as we continue in our series, Lent, God's Pathway to Grace. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, step two in this process, uh, which is entitled Resist the Devil. Uh, but before we get to step two, let me do a quick review again, and this is going to be really quick. Uh, if you have been tracking with us, you know that our foundational truth for this uh, series has been everything God does for us, He does by grace. Our biblical passage has been James chapter 4, uh, verses 4 to 10, and included is this interesting statement in verse 6. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Our conviction is that God, because of his love for us, wants to give us his grace, wants to pour his grace uh, into our hearts and into our lives. But the problem is that our pride, our self-reliance, our independence from God closes the door on grace. It prevents God from being able to give us the grace that he really wants to give. Now, because God loves us so much, we've been discovering, and because he wants to pour his grace into our lives, he resists us to humble us because as we are humbled, humility opens the door to God's grace uh, once again. You remember that I have been reminding us that we have a choice. We can choose to humble ourselves or God, out of his love for us, will humble us himself. He will do it for us. Uh, uh, he will humble us. <clears throat> we discovered uh, that it's best for us to choose to do it ourselves. And then, uh, obviously, the question is, so how can we do that? How can we uh, humble ourselves before the God who loves us? And that's where we've been uh, discovering from James here in this passage of James 4, uh, the steps to follow along God's pathway uh, to grace. Last Sunday, we looked at step one, uh, and the key verse from James 4 was the first part of verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Uh, and uh, uh, here's a quote, submission is not about authority, it's not about obedience, but submission is all about relationships of love and respect. Now, last Sunday, uh, I sent us home with a little project uh, to practice submitting to God. Uh, it was in the form of this little prayer on the card that was a handout. I assume there are probably uh, some more of these available if you missed getting one uh, last week. But it was a prayer uh, formed by Richard Baxter back in the 1600s. Very simple. Lord, what thou wilt, where thou wilt, and when thou wilt. And I encourage you to uh, keep that little prayer where you can see it and uh, where you're able to use it. Well, this morning, we're going to consider the next step on the pathway to grace, which is step two, and it's resist the devil. In the James 4, verse 7, second part, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Obviously... James is simply reminding us that we have an enemy. And in this particular place, he's referred to as the devil. His other names, probably the other most common one would be Satan. Uh, but here, James refers to him as the devil. Now, remember the fact that we are commanded to resist him is evidence that Satan has a negative agenda against us. Uh, the devil is initiating something that is threatening to us. That's why God commands us to resist him. The other thing, remember, I told you last week that whenever God gives us a command, it's a, it's a flag that says, 
Here's something that we can't do on our own, but we need God's grace uh, to enable us uh, to do it. So <clears throat> we're, uh, we're going to be looking at this idea of resisting Satan. I want to remind you of the words of Jesus in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Uh, the last part of verse 10 is quoted quite often. Uh, here's Jesus saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You've heard that quoted before. The first part of the verse isn't as often quoted or isn't as familiar to us. Here's the way the verse begins. The thief. Now please understand, when Jesus refers to the thief, he's really talking about Satan or the devil. So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus here is describing Satan's agenda against us. Now let's look at the three words that Jesus uses. First of all, he comes to steal. What does he want to steal? Well, he wants to steal our peace and our joy. He wants to kill. What does he want to kill? Well, he wants to kill our heart for God. He wants to kill our trust in the goodness of God. And then ultimately, he wants to destroy. He wants to destroy our potential, both now and for all eternity. Uh, a few years ago, uh, David Clarity was the evangelist at Wesley Acres Camp, and I've never forgotten a statement that he made. He said that Satan has an agenda for us. He wants to wear us down so he can win us over and wipe us out. That's pretty good, isn't it? Wear us down, win us over, wipe us out. Now, as we've already uh, uh, been alerted this morning, the Apostle Paul deals with this theme of resisting the devil in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You see, this is what God desires for you and for me. He wants us to be strong, not in our own strength, but in the mighty power of of God. Then the Apostle Paul tells us how. In other words, how to be strong in the Lord. Can you read verse 11 with me? Can you see it well enough to read it? Let's read it together. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, do you notice the word that Paul used there? The devil's schemes. The light ought to come on there. Uh, that he has an, a destructive agenda for us. He is scheming against us. And when someone schemes against you, they don't have your best interest at heart, for sure. Satan is a devious strategist. His agenda is to destroy us. And one of the ways that he does this is by establishing strongholds in our lives. Now, uh, I'm going to try and explain uh, this teaching to you. You'll notice in your bulletin there's an insert. Uh, and uh, uh, track with me as best you can. But I've given you this insert so that after you can, uh, in your quiet time or whenever, you can study more fully uh, and, and perhaps better understand and more effectively apply uh, these truths uh, in your life. But let me just walk you through them quickly here. Paul warns us about this, uh, this issue of strongholds in Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 27, he says, Do not give the devil a foothold. Now, uh, a foothold is a purchase. Like a mountain climber looks for a foothold where he can get some purchase so that, uh, that he can uh, make his climb. Well, that's the idea. And here's, here's the way we need to understand it. We give the devil a foothold or we surrender ground to him in three main ways. And here are the three, and, and Paul mentions these in Ephesians chapter 4. Through bitterness or an unwillingness to forgive those who hurt or offend us. The second way is through greed and... Uh, Greed isn't just being greedy, but it's also uh, 
forms of idolatry where we put something ahead of God. We make something or the acquisition of something more important uh, than our relationship with God. The third way uh, that we surrender ground to Satan and allow him to establish strongholds is through immorality or moral impurity. Whether that's in our thought life, whether that's in what we watch and see, or, or whatever it may be. Now here's the challenge. When we surrender ground to him, Satan is then free to build strongholds on his turf. You see, it becomes his turf when we surrender that ground to him uh, through uh, one of the ways that I've just mentioned. So he then is able to build strongholds. These strongholds take the form of lies or false ideas. Notice the red oval on the screen. And, and this enables Satan to influence us negatively and to prompt us to make unwise decisions going forward. Now a consequence all of, of all of this is that God then allows tormentors in the form of negative emotions and ideas that afflict our soul. I, I wish I had time to go into it. I don't, but you'll be able to. But in Matthew chapter 18, we have the parable of the unmerciful servant. And this is where this idea uh, is articulated by Jesus about tormentors. Uh, and you can, uh, you can follow that up if you care to. I want you to look at the slide and notice the negative emotions uh, that are represented here. Uh, lust, uh, that's uh, the improper desiring of a variety of things. Fears, and fears can come in so many different shapes, sizes, and varieties. The issue of depression uh, can be uh, one of these tormentors. And then Anger, uncontrollable anger, can also be one of these. Now, please understand, the reason that God allows these tormentors is to humble us, to bring us low so that our hearts turn back to him and uh, he then can open the door to his grace and pour his grace uh, into our lives. Now, if as we're going through this, you're saying, wow, Pastor Vic, I think I may have uh, surrendered some ground to Satan. Uh, I may have given him the opportunity to establish some strongholds uh, in my life. Well, uh, if that's the case currently, or if you think it might be in the future, then you'll want to look at this little section on how to regain ground, some steps to regain ground that we may have uh, surrendered uh, to Satan. I'm just going to walk through it really quickly. And again, um, you have the handout in the bulletin or the, uh, the insert in the bulletin, and uh, I've given you the scripture references. And if you really want to explore this, I encourage you to look up these passages and, uh, and ponder them as the Holy Spirit leads you. So how are we going to take back the ground that we've surrendered to Satan? Number one, we need to confess any known sins. 1 John 1, 9, remember, says if we confess our sins, God's faithful to forgive and to cleanse. The second thing is we need to claim the blood of Christ for cleansing. Uh, Peter has an amazing passage in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, uh, where he, he says, you know, when, when God wanted to rescue us, he didn't use gold or silver or anything like that. The most precious gift that he could give was the shed blood of his son. And that's what God gave. So claim the blood of Christ for cleansing. Number three, ask God. And I've inserted there the words out loud. Uh, sometimes it helps to just speak it out because uh, we hear it as well. Ask God out loud to regain the ground. And the biblical reference here is the 23rd Psalm, uh, where it says, He restores my soul. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about taking action that God can use to restore our souls. Then the fourth step in the process is to tear down strongholds with God's truth. 
This is a great passage in 2 Corinthians. Uh, Paul says the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Uh, you know, it's not even balloons that we're going to fight with here. On the contrary, the weapons that we're going to use have divine power to demolish strongholds. There's the word again. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's a powerful passage, and, and, and you'd do well to uh, reflect on it, as would I. The fifth step is transform your mind with truth. I, I love this verse from Romans chapter 12 and verse, few, uh, verse 2, rather. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? In the Word of God, using the Scriptures. And then finally, the, the, the final step, the sixth step, fully forgive offenders. Uh, I'm not sure if we really get this uh, from the Lord's Prayer. Uh, he says, forgive us our debts as we also forgive uh, or have forgiven our debtors. And it's interesting, in all of the elements in the Lord's Prayer, the only one that Jesus comes back and talks about is this matter of forgiveness. Here's what he says in verse 14 of Matthew 6. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, folks, listen to this, but... If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sin. That is a heavy duty verse that should cause us uh, some significant pause. Well, I, I, uh, I realize that I've just sort of touched on a huge area, but I'm hoping that the little insert will help you. And if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to connect with me uh, going forward. Back to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, can you read this with me? Verse 12, let's read a good strong voice. Here we go. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Folks, when I read a verse like that, the only thing that comes to mind is the statement, we are at war. Can you see that? Sadly, too many Christians drift along as though they were at a Sunday school picnic or something, rather than being aware that we are caught up in a war. And if we're not aware that we're in a war, then we will not be taking advantage of the, the weapons that God provides for us in that war. Verse 13 of Ephesians 6 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Now, Please notice it didn't say if the day of evil comes, did it? It said when the day of evil comes. I'm, I'm wondering if there's anybody besides me here this morning that thinks that that day is here. There is so much terrible stuff happening in our world. It's what the Word of God predicted, that as the return of Jesus draws closer Evil will be more outward and more apparent and more evident. And the fact that we are at war will become an even greater reality. As I suggested, Paul uses the example of a Roman soldier to illustrate our spiritual armor. Uh, it's interesting, Cindy mentioned uh, Dr. Bill McRae. A number of years ago, uh, Dr. McRae uh, was the speaker at our pastor's retreat. And uh, interestingly, he talked about uh, the spiritual armor that God has for us. A and he said something I don't think I would heard anybody else say. He said, uh, putting on the full armor of God is not a simple on-the-spot 
prayer we pray. Like, oh God, buckle me up with the breastplate of righteousness. He said, it's more like a character profile of the kind of person that God wants us to be so that we will be empowered to resist the devil. Does that make sense? Uh, It's a character profile. Each piece of the armor represents a certain character quality that God wants through His Spirit to build into us so that we can be soldiers ready for the war. So here's what I want to do. I want to quickly go through our spiritual armor, uh, this time without balloons. <clears throat> but we're going to go through it. Uh, bless you, Pastor Holly. That was amazing. You are so creative. We love you. Okay. <clears throat> here's, here's the first one. Uh, it's called the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Dr. McRae said, what Paul is really saying here is that the, the number one issue for defeating Satan is to live a life of integrity. Does that sound like the belt of truth? I think it does. And, and interestingly, uh, the, the, the belt was the thing that held all of the rest of the armor together. So integrity then is foundational uh, to our being re- able to resist Uh, the devil. The second piece uh, in the armor of God was the breastplate of righteousness. Again, Dr. McRae suggested that that this represents being loyal to the holy laws of God, respecting the holiness of God. And he suggested that a couple of good examples from the Old Testament would be Daniel. Remember his integrity. And then uh, Joseph, who stood for righteousness. The third part of the armor is feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of, uh, of peace. I didn't know this, but Roman soldiers wore special shoes that were kind of like football cleats. They had little studs on the bottom. Now, you can understand why. When you're out on the battlefield, the last thing you want to do is have your feet slip. And so the studs kept them solid and steady uh, as they waged war against the enemy. Uh, I I think this suggests a readiness on our part to be able to share Jesus with other people, to share the good news of the gospel. The fourth element here uh, is the shield of faith. God wants us to have faith in his promises. God wants us to have faith that enables us, <coughs> pardon me, to trust him unflinchingly. And uh, of course, it's with the shield of faith that we're able to withstand the fiery darts of the evil, the evil one. Can I just throw this out? When we lower the shield of faith in our lives, in our walk, that's when we become discouraged. Because lowering of the field, a shield of faith uh, whacks at our courage. And discouragement is a lack of courage. God is faithful. He finishes what he starts. I love this uh, verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. The fifth element of worship is the helmet of salvation. Uh, Initially, that's becoming a Christian. And and can I just say this, dear friend, if you are here and you've never taken that step and put your faith and trust in Jesus and uh, confessed Him as your Lord and your Savior, I encourage you to do that. That's the first step putting on the helmet of salvation and inviting Jesus to be your forgiver and surrendering to him as your loving leader. Uh, We are to live in the hope of salvation. And hope is the confident expectation which which comes from our salvation, which is both a mind matter and a heart matter. The sixth piece of armor 
is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This represents our ability to resist the enemy with a, an appropriate word from the Word. Uh, an, an appropriate spoken word from Scripture. Uh, this is exactly what Jesus did. You, you notice in our responsive reading, uh, when Satan uh, tempted him in some way, he countered with what? He quoted the Scriptures. He spoke God's Word. He refuted Satan's lies with God's truth. Now, Paul mentions one more thing here. Uh, it's, it's not very often included uh, in the armor, but I think, I think it should be. And it's the matter of prayer. Can you read verse 18 with me? Good strong voices. Here we go. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Did you notice all the alls? Pretty emphatic, isn't he? Now, in this context, prayer sounds like an offensive weapon to protect us. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to wage war against the enemy. But it is also a defensive weapon to protect us. And that's what we see in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.13, where Jesus models the prayer and says we should pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us... And literally, it isn't deliver us from evil, it's deliver us from the evil one. Referring to Satan and the devil again. I want to just throw in here one more uh, idea of resisting the devil. It's from 1 Peter uh, chapter 5. And here's what he says. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, that's the evidence we're at war, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, this is an interesting picture here. Normally, when healthy, vibrant lions hunt, they do not roar. They sneak up on their prey and they kill them. But when lions get old, when their teeth are hanging out or falling out, and, and when they've got rheumatism and arthritis, then they have to use their roaring technique. And here's what they do. They hook up with some young lions who haven't yet learned how to hunt properly. And, and the young lions hide over here. The old lion goes back here and he starts to roar and roar. And if some poor little fawn hears the roaring, what does he do? He runs in the opposite direction. And he runs unwittingly right into the pride of young lions and they destroy him. That's the picture uh, that the Apostle Peter is giving us. That Satan, his power has been ended at the cross and uh, we need to understand that through the blood of Christ and the power of his resurrection, we can indeed resist him. I want to give you uh, a little prayer, a sample prayer, I guess we could call it, uh, that uh, I have used on many occasions to resist Satan. Here it is, simply words like this. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you will bind and rebuke Satan. Place a hedge of protection around, and then I would name the person or describe the situation. And then I would add, I ask this, appealing to the shed blood and the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus. Well, friends, this has been a bit of a sprint here, maybe more like a marathon, uh, but we've had a look at the second step on God's pathway to grace, which is to resist the devil. God's promise is that when we resist him, the devil will what? will flee from us. Did you notice that that's exactly what happened with Jesus in his temptation in the wilderness? It says that the devil left him. The devil fled from him. 
I encourage you this week to practice the spiritual discipline of resisting Satan. And again, uh, please keep this little insert with you and be able to refer back and review the scriptures. And I, I trust that uh, you will be at war and you will be on the winning side because of your dependence on Jesus. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this careful truth from your word this morning. God, would you shake us all up and, and help us to grasp the fact that we are indeed at war. And Lord, we have an enemy. You identify him as the devil or Satan, and you call us to resist him in the power of the shed blood and resurrection life of Jesus. Father, help us to live out this truth this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.